So a question I get asked all the time, probably more than any other questions, I get asked all the time about arborist equipment, climbing gear, rigging gear, stuff like that. I've thought for a long time about making like a series of videos, you know, a video about ropes, a video about mechanical devices, all that stuff. Uh, trying to think of a way to make it fun and exciting, and I've basically just given up on that idea. I'm gonna go with the long and just informative route on this video. So this is not gonna be a very exciting video, guys. I'm just telling you right now. But if you can make it through this whole video, by the end of it, you will know everything that I know about arborist equipment, plus whatever you know. So you're gonna be even more informed than I am, and you'll never feel compelled to ask me another question about tree gear again. I'm gonna go through all of my climbing gear, all of my rigging gear, everything that I've acquired over the last 12 years of being an arborist, and I'm gonna talk about, I'm just gonna tell you everything I know about rigging gear, everything I know about climbing gear, and we'll see how this goes. So, uh, uh, well, I'm gonna take this off the tripod here. This is all my stuff here. Uh, right here I keep stuff that dangles. This is a garbage can. Uh, down here I've got all of my rigging gear. This is all chainsaws and stuff. I probably won't talk too much about my chainsaws. I, I did a video on my old channel about that. I, I, that would be a whole other can of worms. This is all gear that I use regularly that I keep right here. This is all gear that I, uh, that's like stuff I don't want to get rid of, but I don't use it so often. So I put it up there. That's just like long stuff uh, I put up there and a couple other things. And then these are my devices. And I'm just, I'm literally going to go through all this stuff. So we'll just start on this wall. So this is my rig for faller type stuff. Weaver sent me this a while ago. I think Buck and Billy Ray might have helped come up with this. But uh, I keep four wedges with me. You, I used to have a, like a magnesium wedge too with a nice handle on it. I'd use that for uh, banging wedges. Sometimes I'd like that, but I broke it the other day. So I've just got, I use these red and white wedges. I use them because um, this is what uh, my friend Jed uses. And I think that's what Buckin uses as well. And just, you know, the, I just want to basically copy those guys. So I just use the wedges that they use. This is just a small bar wrench. You've seen those before. But yeah, this is the rig I use. It's from Weaver. Um, and then it's got like first aid kit thing here. This is the axe. This, this is my axe. This is one that uh, Jeff Schroeder made me. Did a whole video on that. And then, let's see here. This is a little chain pouch. I just got this like yesterday, I think, from Gordy. Uh, just for keeping an extra chain with you. I don't have an extra chain in there. But yeah, that's my rig setup. Usually I have a uh, like log tape on this too, but I, I broke Mine the other day. Oh yeah, I also got this. I think I got this from Madsen's. This is cool. It's just a plumb bob. So you, you just pull that down. You just dangle it. So like you, you point it at the top of the tree. And then um, wherever this dangles, that'll kind of tell you the angle at which the tree is leaning. All right, moving on. This is just an old lineman harness. I found it at a thrift store for like $6. I, of course, wouldn't climb on it. It's like old dilapidated leather um but it's, i was just like amazed at how basic it was i think i paid like six dollars for that uh these are carabiners i have these are like double locking carabiners okay so these are all my double locking carabiners that i have and i don't have too much to say about these but i do have a few things to say so there are really sort of three factors i'm thinking of when i'm looking at carabiners basically it comes down to you know is it steel or is it aluminum and then the gate to how does the gate open so like these are three examples so this is you know these are all double locking triple action so one two three actions to open it and then it, it locks twice so like it locks this way and then it locks that way which is pretty standard for climbing and rigging carabiners you want to make sure it's like that but uh usually you'll have two types of gates so this one twists up and sideways this one twists down and sideways and then this one uh, also twists up and sideways. But this is steel, so I so basically I use aluminum for climbing because it's lighter, and I use steel for rigging because it's stronger. So a steel carabiner, I just use that for rigging. Some guys keep it on their climbing lines because it's easier to manipulate with the extra weight. I don't like the extra weight. Um, I I always try to favor carabiners that uh, open like this up and sideways rather than down and sideways because what happens is. Um, Look at this one. I think this might have been from my original climbing kit. This is also a pirate, same one. But what happens is when you tie a knot right here or you've got webbing or something and you go to open this, sometimes the rope actually jams right there and it's actually kind of frustrating, hard to open. So um, 
You know, I've got a few of these. I use, they're, they're perfectly fine, but I just prefer ones that twist up and sideways. This is my favorite carabiner. It's the Petzl AMD. I just like the oval shape. I, I just, I like this carabiner a lot. This is a similar one from US Rigging. Um, I think that's a Rock Exotica one. This one's actually down and sideways. So I, I use these for, um, I like this perfect, oh, I think this is actually, I got this for my uh, Rion Rounds tether, which I let somebody borrow and I don't have with me. But basically I'll use a shorter carabiner if I'm trying to like shorten up the system, you know? Um, this is a cool carabiner, a lot of, this is a revolver. A lot of people will put this like on their hip and then they'll run their, like if they have to lower their saw to the ground for gas, they'll use that little pulley to, to do so. So that's a revolver, so. That's a, this is like a just fatter Petzl AMD. I'm not sure how I ended up with this, but th those are my carabiners. It, and I'm a big fan of just using carabiners like for rigging, especially limbs and stuff. I think on the East Coast, it's more popular to tie knots as you go, but on the Pacific Northwest, if we've got a big fur to rig out, I mean, it could have hundreds of limbs on it. You're not, you don't want to tie a knot every single time. You just want to have a carabiner. Just clip it on and then rig it down. So moving on. Okay, so talking about harnesses, I keep my monkey beaver right there hung up. Um, so this is my monkey beaver harness, and I got this from August and his crew when I toured their um, their facility. They even signed it. <laughs> they got their, their names on here. And I really, really like this harness a lot. It's a lot of padding, and what's really cool about it too is it has really nice suspenders, and it really helps share the load when you have a large saw on your hip. So Basically, I, I have two saddles. I also have this Sequoia. Um, okay, so this is my Sequoia. I have suspenders for it as well. Um, it's not attached right now, but I, I do have suspenders for the Sequoia. They're, they're kind of thin compared to the Monkey Beaver suspenders. These suspenders are like really beefy. This, I put it on and I was like not that big of a fan, so I ended up just taking the suspenders off because I, I felt like it kind of dug into my shoulder a little bit. So. I'm not using the suspenders on that, but basically these are the two saddles. I've had lots of saddles over the years. These are the two that I have right now, and I'm really happy with both of them. So, you know, when I'm at home, when I'm working in Washington, I use my monkey beaver because it's a lot more padding. It's a lot just more of like a robust, sturdy harness. It's also a lot heavier. It's a lot bulkier. Um, when I'm traveling around, I bring my Sequoia with me because this thing is like probably half the weight at least I'd say of this. It's much smaller, much more compact. What I like about the Sequoia a lot is when I wear it, it's really tight fitting. It doesn't sag, it doesn't drop. I can like walk around the job site wearing it. It doesn't, it just really fits well and you're super light, you're super agile wearing it. So I love this saddle. What I love about this one is you can put a lot of weight on it because it's so, you know, it's just so beefy, you know? And August did a really great job coming up with the design. So they're both really great options. I get asked a lot, what kind of harness should you buy? And there are a lot of good options, but uh, basically it kind of comes down to these two things. One thing I'll, I'll mention when you buy a harness, so this is actually an adjustable bridge, um, but you want to have some sort of rope bridge. There are some options that just have rings. <laughs> they still make saddles like this. They, they go around and they've actually just got these D-rings and there are a few variations like that, and those will get the job done. You can get up, you can get down, but if you want any sort of agility in the tree, you, you really want a rope bridge. That's probably the most important thing when picking out a saddle because that's what's gonna allow you to attach here, you know, to repel and stuff like that. So I love both these saddles for what I use them for. I use this when I'm home, I use that when I'm traveling. And they're both really great. I wouldn't change a thing about either of them. I, I really like them. They both have their strengths and weaknesses. If you are a bigger guy, I will advise that you go with more padding. So with harnesses, you're always balancing two factors, right? You know, some people like a lightweight harness. Some people like a lot of padding. You really can't have both. So you have to decide what's more important for you. If you're a big, heavy guy, that's gonna put a lot of strain on your body when you're in your saddle. So you're gonna want something with lots of padding, which is gonna mean that you're gonna be carrying more weight up there too. If you're a smaller guy, I'm, I'm like 5'9", 180 pounds, and so um, I, I actually fit pretty well in the Sequoia, and it's, it's, a, it's a good option if you wanna be agile 
mobile, be able to zigzag around the canopy better. So they're both good options, but there's no perfect harness. Those are the two factors you're gonna be balancing, you know, the weight and the padding, really. And another thing with the saddles, you're gonna notice they've got lots of options for gear attachment loops. And you know, I, I, I really like the Sequoia. I like how symmetrical everything is on the Sequoia. But for the most part, to, to be totally honest with you, I've found that every time I've gotten a new saddle, they've had different gear attachment points and I just get used to it, whatever saddle it is. So I, I really don't know that it matters that much the, how the loops are configured. The, the Monkey Beaver, they, they've got these little stiff ones and it's just on one side. And uh, you know, they're, they're fine, but I, I just don't really care that much, honestly, about the actual attachment points because I found that I just get used to it no matter what. And then this is just a, a generic saw lanyard. Oh, here's another thing I forgot to talk about for carabiners. So, like, when I'm inspecting the carabiners, so when I'm inspecting the carabiner, what I do is I, I go and I open it, right? And if you snap it closed, right, it, it snaps just like it should. But when I'm testing them, what I'll do is I'll open it and then I'll slowly bring it back and slowly let go. And if it closes, uh, then that's, that, that, that's how I know that the, the carabiner is good. That's how I inspect those. When they get to the point where they don't do that, uh, so like this one, is, I keep my chainsaw on this one. So see, when I slowly let go of this, well, it, did, it didn't do that earlier. See, if I slowly let go, yeah. See, it doesn't even, that, <laughs> it doesn't even close. And I can kind of make it go closed, but I, I wouldn't climb on that. I wouldn't trust my life on it, but I'll use it for my, uh, I'll, I'll just retire it. So I'll, I'll hang my chainsaw from it. I think it's fine. As I'm saying this out loud, I'm thinking <laughs> maybe I should replace this because maybe I should care about the, the guys underneath my chainsaw, but I just, I think it's probably okay for doing that. So anyways, when when uh, when I inspect my gear and the carabiner isn't satisfactory, I usually retire it for something else. This is just a generic chainsaw lanyard. I don't have any opinions on these lanyards. You know, I, I like always, I haven't, they have a bunch of different options. This is all I've really ever used and it's fine. I. I have had some where it's just a ring on the end, which is kind of weird. I like this dog leash snap, right? And then that's just curve stitched on. This goes onto my hip. It just racks onto this thing. This is like a, a Buckingham. I, I don't know what it's called. I got it from Buckingham. It works really well. I've had a few things, like I've had a transporter and stuff, and uh, they're all good. You know, you, you the idea is you, you keep your saw close to your hips so that you're not expending so much energy pulling it all the way up with a long lanyard. Um, one of the downsides is that the chain can kind of tear up your boots and your pants, keeping it there too. So some of the old school guys, they'll, they'll let the saw dangle way down low. Most modern climbers, they, they, they keep it pretty close to their hip so that it's, you know, so you, like I said, you're not pulling it all up. So I, I keep mine on my hip usually. And I, I don't know what all this stuff costs because a lot of this, like I bought years ago and it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure what all this stuff costs, but I'll just start down here. All right, so down here we've got this row right here is where I keep all of my rigging gear. So this is my GRCS. I actually got this from Kevin Ham. You can buy these on his website, gametrees.com. I'm really grateful for Kevin for it. It's the GRCS is just, it's an amazing device. You can, you know, crank and lift all sorts of crazy stuff with it. And yeah, it's just, it's just amazing. I think it's probably the best sort of rigging equipment that a tree service could own that doesn't have an engine attached to it. I mean, you can, you can do a lot with these, especially you get trees off of houses and all sorts of things. So that's my GRCS. If we come over here, I'll show you this stuff. So Okay, so going through my rigging gear, um, this right here is, this is called a Petzl transporter bag. I forget what size it is. They, they do it in liters, so it, it's always, I forget how much it is. But anyways, I think it's the big one that they sell, the big bag. And inside of this, I keep, I've got my cord wrap, which, you know, uh, the GRCS is really cool, but the, the nice thing about the port wrap is it's lighter and it's easier to teach someone on. Also, if something hits it, you know, this costs like a hundred bucks. The GRCS is like, I think it's something like $3,000. So this might be $150, but anyways, this is a port wrap. It's a large one. I have a, a sling on it. It's just a, it's just a dead eye sling that I spliced out of, this is three quarter inch Samson 
double braid. And so I keep this port wrap in this bag with this block, this little ISC block. It weighs like a pound or something, or a couple pounds or something. It's crazy, but this thing, I, I really love this block. I've had this for years and uh, it just opens and closes like this. And I really like these ultra slings. I splice this out of half inch 10X. So half inch block, half inch 10X. This is half inch rigging line. Generally, you wanna keep that all the same. Like it doesn't make any sense to have a three quarter inch block on a half inch piece of 10X because then it's, you know, this is, becomes the, the weakest point in the link. So I keep all the sizes consistent. So this is a, yeah, like I said, it's a half inch ISC, you know, arborist block. And these ultra slings, I really like these because you just find the nearest loop and go through it and it's really easy to set. What I found in my travels um, is, it seems like the guys on the East Coast, they do a lot more, uh, or <laughs> I haven't even been to the East Coast, yeah, I've been to the Midwest, but it seems like guys with those types of trees, they generally, a lot of them like the dead eye sling rather than the ultra sling because they can reset the whole thing without taking the block. Like I have to take the rope out of the block before I take this out of the loop and then reset it. Whereas if you just tie a knot with a dead eye sling, you can untie this, the rope's still in the block, lower it and tie it back on. So loads of different options for sling. There aren't that many options for slings, what am I saying? There is uh, the ultra sling, the dead eye sling, which is like what I have on my port wrap, so I'll tie a timber hitch with that. There's a whoopee and a loopy. Uh, and I think I have some of those slings, so I'll show you that in a minute. But but so this is a this is my rigging line. See, this is a steel carabiner. I forget what kind, um, but this is a, it's on a spliced eye. This is half inch uh, double ester lawn from Yale. That's what this is, and uh, yeah, that's all right. Anyways, um, this is 300 feet long. I need to have this rigging line needs to be 300 feet long because basically that allows me on our tall trees in the Pacific Northwest, like a Douglas fir. You know, if the tree's 160 feet tall and I take the top at 150 feet, I have to have 300 feet because it has to be doubled so they can get back to the ground. So this, I, I would say I do 90, at least 90% of my rigging with what I just showed you with that block and this rigging line. Yeah, I think, I think it can hold like 10,000 pounds or something. All, all the MBS and the tensile strength, all that really nerdy stuff gets confusing for me. I know that this thing is, pretty strong. I'll do big limbs and tops and stuff on this, but if I get into like larger wood where I'm rigging large wood, then I switch to a bigger rope. I wouldn't use this for something like that. But like I said, I mean 90, at least 90% of the rigging I do, I just do it on the half inch rope. I, I like, you know, bigger is not always better, especially when it comes to rigging. It's better in the sense that, yeah, things are safer with, uh, with bulkier stuff, but you just, I find myself expending a lot of energy using big heavy blocks big heavy ropes. I really try to keep things as, you know, as light as reasonably possible, you know, while also trying to be safe. So I use a pretty small rigging gear on most of the stuff I do. This right here is half inch Samson uh, stable braid. So um, it's a really similar construction to the uh, double estralon I just showed. I, they, they don't really perform any differently from each other. They've got two ropes, it's a, there's a core inside, it's a rope inside of a rope. I don't know why, but that's the way that it works with <laughs> rigging lines. <laughs> the rope stuff really confuses me. I really don't get that much about the ropes. It gets really confusing. But generally speaking, rigging lines are gonna be double braided ropes um, for whatever reason. And the slings, the slings are usually gonna be some sort of hollow braid for two reasons. One is that this material is really easy to splice because it's actually, there's nothing on the inside. It's like a hollow core. So it's easy to splice. And also I think um, they don't stretch that much. I think you don't want that much stretch where the sling is. I think you want the stretch to be happening in the rope itself. I think I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff, but I get asked questions. So we're just going through all of it. So yeah, generally speaking, you're gonna have a double braid line for your lowering line. Um, at least most modern guys, a lot of older, you know, school guys, they'll use like, some guys use three strand and stuff. I, I don't know what the, the pros to that is, but I use, I use double braid for rigging line. I use 12 strand hollow braid for my rigging slings.
Oh, and that was 150 feet. That one I just showed you, that Hank rope is 150 feet long. I use that for tag lines or short trees. Like, I don't like to have a super long rigging line if I don't need it because it's just like if the guys have to move it, it's all that more work. It's all more likely to get chipped. So I try to, I used to think like the longer the rope, the better all the time. But over the years, I've really moved more towards like trying to use as little rope as possible just to keep the work scythe tidy and safe and efficient, you know, not making it any more complicated than it needs to be. So I use that uh, a lot. Um, yeah, for just minor stuff. This is my uh, zip line kit that I got from August Hunnicky. I, I did like an unboxing video of this, so I don't need to talk about it too much. I think he talked about it a bit. It's got some sort of static line. Um, I think it's HTC or HTP something or other. Um, it's actually pretty thick, but the idea with the, the static line, back to the rope stuff, you know, the, the static, you'd be amazed at how much, I wish I could give you the exact numbers because I saw a video once on YouTube about like the difference in the amount of pull that you get with a static line versus one with stretch. I mean, it's incredible. Imagine if you're pulling a tree over or making a zip line or something, you want as little stretch as possible because say you're pulling a tree over and you've got a really stretchy rope. First, you have to get all the stretch out of the rope before you really start pulling it. So the, the, the less stretchy the rope is, the better it's gonna be. So really good for zip lining, really good for pulling things over. It's also static lines are really good for ascending because if you're taking a step up the rope, every time you're taking a step up, if the rope is stretching, that's all the more energy that you're expending that's going nowhere. So um, I'll probably talk about that a little more when I get to my climbing rope, but we gotta get through the rigging gear. So I use the double braid stuff for um, you know lowering. You actually want that to be somewhat elastic because you want it to be able to absorb the shock when you're you know, taking a piece, you, you don't want the energy all jar. And like if you were trying to lower stuff on this rope, it, you'd feel it, it'd be, it'd put a lot of stress on the rigging point, a lot of stress on the tree, and you would feel it, it would really jolt you. So this is great for zip lining, um, but not so great for lowering things. But uh, this is his speed line kit. It's got a, it's, you know, it, it's got stuff in it that, like I said, I already did a video on that. You, you can check it out if you want. And, um, <laughs> to, to, to be honest with you, I, I've never used like all this stuff, but I, I use the rope and the slings a lot. These are August zipline slings. These things are awesome. I, these are really clever because um, he's got these really special carabiners. See, it's a pirate, just like this. But what's cool is, so this goes down, you know, it's triple action, double locking. These are you just, it's single locking, double action, right? It just turns sideways and it opens, which is not good for uh, life support stuff. You know, you wouldn't put this on the bridge of your harness. You wouldn't climb with this because it's easy to open, you know, like if it rubs against things, it can open. But zip lining, you know, when you're, most guys call it speed lining. I call it zip lining for no particular reason. But when you're doing this, you know, a hundred times, taking these off and on your harness, having that one fewer action, one less, one fewer action, it saves a lot of time. It's really clever. I, I would have never thought about it, but you know, August thought of that and I think it's awesome. And then he, his slings are really cool. Let me show you my old slings. Okay, this beautiful wad I've got right here. My old, <laughs> this is a mess. So these are my old zip lining slings that I used to use and I, I would girth hitch, I'd use the skinnier stuff. I, I like the skinny stuff, but I actually started using the skinnier straps just because everybody at work had the thicker ones like this. And that was just so I could more English, more easily distinguish which ones belong to me or not. I girth hitch around the carabiner. You actually lose a little bit of strength girth hitching like that. So the way August worked around it was he just goes straight over the carabiner, but then he uses this tiny rubber band to consolidate it all because you also don't want just the carabiner flopping and sliding all around the sling when you're up there working. It, it gets really cumbersome, really inefficient. So this is a great, he's got the best of both worlds. He's got it neat and consolidated, but he's also got extra strength because he's not girth hitching it around the carabiner. And I always buy a whole bunch of different sizes of these because I always figure it's good to have some short, some long, some medium. But then <laughs> you end up with this big tangled mess that I got going on here and uh, what I found is all of August are this same length and maybe sometimes I clip one to the other to make it longer, but he's actually right. It's better to just have, 
you know, a whole bunch that are this length. I don't know what this length is, but it's 24 inches maybe. I don't know what it is, but it, it's a really good length, whatever it is. And uh, the magazine pouch thing he's got is really cool because you just clip them all right there. And I'm like a big time fan of these slings. They're really awesome. These are like the most underrated piece of tree climbing equipment, I have to say. These zipline straps, that's what I, I call them. They're also, they also go by like endless loops, I think, or webbing, I don't know, there are a bunch of names, but I call them zipline straps. And these are like the most underrated piece of tree cutting equipment for climbing. You can use these for so many things, it's totally nuts. Like even just, you know, storing things up in the canopy, you know, just girth hitching stuff to branches if you wanna dangle something up in the tree for a little while. I mean, or there are so many uses, small rigging stuff, redirects. I mean, there are just so many uses. So when you're buying climbing gear, I strongly recommend that you buy some, a lot of, I think a lot of the sites, they're gonna sell this and this separate. Um, so you might need to buy the loop and this, but you could just buy these straight from August too. Um, keep in mind, this carabiner is not good for life support because it's single locking, um, double action you, you want triple action, double locking, but these are seriously, seriously handy. You should definitely have some of these if you're climbing. I, I usually, a lot of times I keep a couple of those on my harness when I'm climbing. All right, down here, so I've got a couple of these uh, CMI three quarter inch blocks right here. And these are, uh, I bought these years ago. These are pretty old and they're fine. They're great. They're, you know, I don't know what they cost now when I bought these like, 10 years ago, I think it was like 150 bucks for those or something. And those are really good, but a few years ago I upgraded to the, this uh, three quarter inch impact block because it's just, it's nice when you're doing big rigging to just know that you have the peace of mind. This thing is rated for some stupid amount of weight. I can't remember, uh, um, I, I'm not good with all the numbers, but it's super duper strong. It's got this hole so you can suspend it. Um, and you have even more options that way. I've never, I've never done that. I just use it like a normal block. But it's just nice to know when you're doing big rigging that you, you don't have to worry about that. Um, so these are just some slings that I have. This is a big three quarter inch ultra sling. Um, and then once again, three quarter inch block, three quarter inch sling. And then I'll, I'll run a three quarter inch rope in that usually. Um, but you know, it's, it's important to think about, especially if you have a system like block, rigging line, and sling, you know, which is the, the weak link. You don't want one to be way smaller than the other. These are just extra slings. This is extra 10X um, for making slings. This is a little mini porter app. I, you know, I bought this a few years ago. I think the idea was to try to like do some, uh, I don't know why I bought it. I. I thought it, I liked the idea of being able to do sort of more elaborate rigging from inside the tree, but I, I actually almost never use that, honestly. It's cool because it's really, it's good for tag lines and stuff. It's really light. It's mobile. This is an Amsteel sling. This is another ultra sling. I, I'm a big fan of the ultra slings, if you couldn't tell. Um, I heard somewhere that, you're, that 10X is good to use for rigging slings, but not Amsteel. I don't know why. I, that doesn't... I don't know if that's true or not, but this is it. I made this Amsteel sling years and years ago. Um, so this is Amsteel. This is, hold on, I'll actually show you, because this thing can hold some stupid amount of weight. This is what's called a uh, whoopee sling. So basically one eye is fixed. So basically one eye is fixed one eye is adjustable and you know you, you basically go around the tree and then you go through this line and then you can tighten this one up to get it like really snug and secure to the tree what's weird is when i like like 10 years ago it was like these were all the rage these um these whoopee slings everybody used them and i just used them for years because i figured that was what was best um but the, they actually the, the problem is that this part that's adjustable that slides um, is it gets sap in it and it's it becomes so hard to adjust that I ended up just switching totally. I either like the uh, um, I, I like the ultra slings or just a dead eye and I just tie a knot. There's also uh, loopy slings which I don't have any of right now, but that's actually 
probably a better option, but it also involves um, a sliding piece of the rope like this, which also gums up with sap, but those are the basic sling types that I've seen people use. There's ultra slings, whoopies, loopies, dead eyes. Um, I've got two of these. I made two of these with, so this one's three quarters, this one's half inch. And uh, these are, th th these rings are like really, really bulletproof. They're crazy strong, they're crazy reliable. You just take a look at it. It's like very easy to inspect, you know. They're pretty cheap and easy to make. Um, you get a lot of strength for, you know, not a lot of dollars if you know how to whip these up. If you don't know how to splice, then I, I don't know if you really want, if you know how to splice this stuff, which is not that hard to do, then you can really have a lot of options with these. These are really cool for if you've got a real sprawly tree, putting this around the trunk and trying to keep the rope close to the trunk. It keeps the job site more tidy and it also makes the tree stronger because it's more like a fishing pole. On that sprawling silver maple video, we had a bunch of these in the tree um, for that reason. Um, these are really popular on Instagram and stuff. You know, I really tried to give these a shot. These kind of annoy me because you have to take the, I, I use a carabiner a lot for my rigging and I have to take the carabiner off and on constantly when I'm messing with these. And I just, and it's also more friction. So some people like more friction, some people don't like it. I don't like it as much because like if you want to lift something up, you've got a lot more friction. This is harder. Uh, I, I like these for the whole fishing pole thing, um, keeping the rope close to the tree. But honestly, I don't get what the rate is about. I think that if you have a block, I just think it's so much better than this because you can lift things with them. You know, I think these are kind of just like a trendy thing. And I I don't know what the deal is, but <laughs> they're, they're really popular. Like a lot of really good climbers. It seems like most really good climbers have switched to those instead of blocks. And I just can't really wrap my mind around it because I really tried giving those a go. And the, the block is just so much smoother. Um, harder to inspect, more expensive, but just, I recommend just getting a block, honestly. If you, yeah, just get a, you just get a block. This is just another dead eye sling, a little, uh, I don't know if it's longer or shorter, I can't remember, but it's just another dead eye sling. Here's another rigging line. This one is a Pelican rope. This is five eighths, I think. Um, and I'll use this for, you know, for rigging pretty big wood actually. I use this for like big stuff. Uh, I did that big tricky backyard fur. I've done a few like really big negative uh, rigs with this. So it's just like a hair smaller than three quarters, but um, it's still a really beefy rope. Um, this one's 200 feet long. And that's a pelican rope, bull rope. Kind of the same thing as the stable braid, it's the double braid, you know. This bad boy, this is the real deal. This one, <laughs> um, so this rope right here, I have a carabiner on it, but honestly, like, if I'm gonna do something, so if I'm gonna do some like real big heavy duty stuff, I, I usually just tie a knot because it's just one fewer thing, one, one less, one fewer thing in the system to fail. So, this rope is three quarter inch Samson stable braid. This thing is like mega beefy. It's 300 feet long. I've only used this a handful of times. This is like if the truck is stuck and we've got to like pull that out or we've got to like yard a huge log. We've got to do, you know, like big beefy stuff all whip this thing out. But I've only used it a few times just because it's, it's really heavy, really bulky. You know, like I said, it's not, there, there's no need to use this. Um, most of the time, but you know, you, if you, like I said, if it's like you're, you're like moving a truck or something, you might want something really beefy and really long too, because you lose a lot of strength when you connect the ropes together too. So this is sort of like my emergency rope when, when I really need it, I've got it, but I, I hardly ever use it. Okay. So this row right here, this is all the tree climbing stuff that I use regularly. Um, all the work stuff that I use regularly. I keep on this shelf right here. So I'll go through all of it. This is my Protos helmet by Fanner. Um, so th this helmet's really, so 
this helmet's really cool because everything's integrated, right? That the earmuffs. Uh, most of so mo most of the time when you buy these, they have like a visor on the front. Um, and I took my visor off because I just because um, you know all the GoPro stuff. It's better without the visor in the way. But it has these really cool integrated glasses that just fold down. And even these glasses are actually adjustable too. Um, and then it's got the, the muffs that fold down. And it, so it's all integrated. So what I like about this helmet is you get a lot of stuff and it's all really compact, you know. One of the downsides of this helmet is it gets really hot in the summertime. I mean, this thing is pretty, pretty beefy. It's got these vents, you know, it open, that open and close. Um, and I, I don't think they do anything. I think it's all just for looks because when it's really hot out and I open those, I don't feel any difference at all. The only thing that happens is I forget to close them and rain gets in there. So I don't know that the vents make any difference. They probably do, otherwise they, they wouldn't make them. But this is a, so these were like, this was like $300 when I bought it. It's probably like $400 now. They're pretty expensive. But what you gotta keep in mind too when you buy these, they're more expensive than the other helmets, but the other helmets are gonna be buying the eye protection and the ear protection separately, whereas this is all included. So it is more money, but you also have a lot of stuff that's kind of included with it, you know. I've had a bunch of different Bluetooth models. Um, my, I have a Vecina, man, what is it? It's like the 33i or something. It's whatever Kevin Ham has. Like I got it before I went over there. It's the newer version of the Cena, and um, those seem to work really well. I had the SMH10 before, and I had the Packhawk Bold before, which was also a really good option. The Bluetooth helmet stuff, I, I get asked about these a lot too, about the Bluetooth helmet stuff. Seattle Tree Care has a, what's it called, Synetics? It's like radio, it uses like radio waves or something. It's like what the military uses, and that's probably the nicest one that I've worked with, but it's like thousands of dollars. It's really expensive. You have to have like a base station there. Pack Talk Bold allows you to have a lot of guys on one channel, and uh, that's a pretty good option I found. The Cena SMH10 is a really good option. It's really basic. It's probably like the easiest one to understand, like how to sync them up and everything. And then the, the more advanced Cena's, they have like this mesh system that you can have a whole bunch of people on them. And so all this to say, the Bluetooth stuff, it almost doesn't matter. Just anything is better than nothing. And they're all finicky. They're all hard to deal with. Um, some of them don't... I had two other Cena's that I experimented with too. That was like the... The 50 and the 20, I think. This was a couple years ago. They And they worked fine until it rained and then they stopped working. So they're all finicky. They're all, none of them are perfect. They're, but, but, but especially working here, like when I was in Hawaii working, like the trees are so much shorter, you can really hear each other more easily on the ground, you know? But when you're 150 feet up in the air, it's so frustrating and you can't clearly communicate to the ground. So. The Bluetooth stuff is such a game changer for me. I'm all about it. So this is my helmet. I really like it. And then, uh, you know, when I'm pretending to be a timber cutter, I like to wear this. This is almost like a costume, right? Because I'm just, I'm just like being a poser. But I really like. The, remember poser? I, mean, I haven't even heard anybody say poser in a long time. I just have like a flashback. Um, but anyways. So this helmet is really cool for a few reasons. One, this helmet's actually from, I bought this on eBay and didn't realize it. It's from like the 1940s, McDonald something or other. Um, and Gordy at West Coast Saw actually makes liners. It had this real dilapidated leather liner in it and he replaced that for me. And this helmet's actually really, really slick. It's really cool for keeping the rain off you. Um, it's also really light, it's really nice. So I'll actually wear this when it's really hot outside um, because it, it's so much cooler than that, and it weighs at least, probably a third as much as that helmet. I'm just I'm just guessing, but I, it's probably a third. So this helmet's really cool. It's also actually, in a lot of ways, it's really safe getting hit with stuff, I imagine, because it's metal. You actually, like, I've actually seen those Protos helmets crack, like, pretty bad from getting hit with branches and stuff. This might get knocked off your head or something, but it's probably pretty hard to penetrate through this uh, this tin helmet. So I wear this when I'm doing logger type stuff. You know, the, the logger types, they have their helmets for a reason, and the arborists have their helmets for a reason. So when I'm climbing a tree, I use that. It's got the chin strap. I've got, you know, it's easier to, on the GoPro and the Sina and everything. So, you know, this is better for climbing, and this is better for, you know, for falling, for cutting timber, just like you'd expect, just like 
that, that's why the, the timber cutters wear these. So those are my two helmets. This is my, uh, this is sort of just my removal rope. Uh, it's in this backpack, you know, this, <laughs> this backpack's pretty slick. I used to use this, I got this originally because it's really nice for crane work. Crane work, it's really nice to have something like this, you know, the backpack, because you're, you're basically, a lot of times you're starting from the top down, you're repelling through the tree. And so having it consolidated is really nice. You take it off and you throw it out. And this rope, um, Pelican Rope sent me this. I think it's called a Tree Viper, I think. And it's a 24 strand. Um, as far as climbing lines go, man, how are we gonna talk about this? Let's see here. So some type of 24 strand arborist rope. Basically, if you're shopping for ropes online, climbing ropes, you're gonna notice some are like 12 strands, some are 16, some are 24. Um, the, basically, it seems like, and I'm really not an expert on this rope stuff, it, it, I get a headache just trying to wrap my mind around it, but the, the fewer the strands, it seems like the better that the ropes grab rope on rope. So like old school guys climbing on Blake's hitches, top line hitches, stuff like that, they like fewer strands because it's grippier. The more strands you have, the smoother the jacket is which is nice for your climbing devices, but maybe not so nice for like a prusik cordage or trying to make a closed system, you know? So it seems like the old school guys tend towards the fewer strands and the newer school guys tend towards the more strands, you know? And this is a 24 strand. And the, the thing about climbing lines from my experience is it's just like saddles. You're always balancing the weight versus the padding with climbing lines, you're always weighing the rope's malleability with its stiffness, right? So, like, a lot of guys like softer ropes because it's easier to tie knots with, and it's just softer on the hands. And a lot of guys like static ropes. So this is an old chunk of, like, an old climbing line. I can't remember what this was. I think it's, I don't even know. This is years old, but it's really stiff. It's, like, HTC or HTP. I think it's... It's sort of similar to August uh, zipline rope, but this is a really stiff line and there are advantages. But so, so years ago, I went all in on the static line, right? I was all about the static line because the thing about us having a really stiff climb line is that if you're out on a limb walk or something and you're balancing, you know, having as little stretch as possible, it's really stable. Also, if you're ascending the rope on ascenders, like I said, you're gonna spend less energy if the rope is really stiff. If the rope is really stretchy, like for instance, this is Samson Velocity. This is really, really soft, malleable rope. This is also a 24 strand. And uh, this is a double braid as well. Like it has a core, and I think the Kern Mantle, I think that, that's a, it's some type of Kern Mantle rope. Really stiff, and I don't, I think the core is a little different, but uh, you know, the advantage to this is it's soft, it feels nicer in the hands, it's easier on your, uh, it seems to be easier on your climbing gear. It's definitely smoother in your climbing devices, easier to tie knots. So, um, and one of the nice things about Velocity in particular is this is a very light rope, so you can have a lot of it and it's not that heavy. So those you're really balanced you're really your options are between do you want a stiff rope or do you want a soft rope and I was all about static line for a long time but over the years I just moved more towards the more malleable the softer the better it's just easier to work with easier to tie knots with and yes if I ascend on my rope I'm gonna burn more energy but it seems like you know it seems like I'm not doing that so often a lot of what I'm doing is like removals you know and I just, I just don't like the way that the static line feels in my hands, honestly. That's probably, if I'm just being honest, I just don't like the way it feels as much as I like the softer rope. So this is a 24 strand Pelican Rope Tree Viper. And this is 150 feet long. So also, so my, my opinions have really changed over the years. And earlier on in my career, I was all about long ropes because, and, and, and not for no good reason, because um, before I discovered SRT and I was all on double rope systems, you know, if I was up a 150 foot tree to get to the ground, I needed 
like let's say I cut myself, right? And I need to bail to the ground. I need 300 feet to get to the ground. Otherwise I gotta retie in, you know, maybe multiple times if my rope is short. But with SRT, you know, now I can tie into the top of the tree. And as long as I'm, you know, 150 feet or, uh, or less, then I can get to the ground. So like this is 150 feet and sometimes this will actually dangle above the ground if I do a tree taller than 150 feet. But for the most part, I found that the, I like the shorter rope because it's less weight and it's easier to like pick up all my rope and throw it down under another side of the tree, isolating the line is what they call it. So I really moved more towards trying to have shorter ropes too, especially crane work because you really, excuse me, you're really moving your rope around a lot. So I've gone even shorter with my crane ropes, but I've been doing 150 feet and that's pretty good. One of the downsides to it is when it comes, if I'm up at the top of the tree and I need gas, I have to manually pull all the rope up, you know, and, and uh, like pull my chainsaw 150 feet up, right? If my rope's short, if my rope is long, I can set it in a pulley or something and I can lower it down. The ground guys can pull it up. So there's really, it seems like no good way to do it when it, you know, but, but then if you're doing that, it's, you know, so 300 feet, yeah, you don't have to pull the chainsaw up yourself, but you're also getting your, your ropes getting more tangled up and everything. So I don't know what the best answer is, but I've moved towards, you know, it's a pain in the butt pulling up, like, like the other day I was pulling up like my 66 at like, I don't know, 120 feet or something. And it's like, it's brutal on the arms, you know, but it's only brutal for a few minutes and at least the rope isn't like tangling and catching up on everything. So I've moved towards shorter ropes over the years, but there are definitely benefits to having the long rope. Um, I, I think I do have a 300 foot line actually, because one thing though, I do like to have a long line if I'm, okay, I've moved toward, <laughs> yeah, this, man, this video is just going on and on. So, like I said, if you watch this whole thing, you'll know everything I know about gear. So I will use longer than 150 feet sometimes. Like if I'm setting a line from the ground, I'm gonna send, I need to set my big shot or something. You know, if I'm shooting my line 100 feet up, I have to have at least 200 feet, right, to get back to the ground. So I'll use longer ropes for that. I'll use longer ropes for, you know, if I'm uh, like a, like pruning a really tall tree because, uh, you know, because I want to be able to get to the ground without retying in a bunch of times. But that's, this is sort of my go-to removal, removal rope. I, I, I'm pretty happy with 150 feet. There are definitely downsides to that length, but... I put way too much thought and stress into like trying to pick the, the right amount of rope. You're just like, probably thinking just move on already. So I'll move on to another length of rope. So this is, this is my crane rope and this bag is really slick. I got this from August as well when I was down there. And this is for crane work and what's really, <laughs> so he showed me this bag and I was like, oh, that's pretty neat. You know, I get it, you know. But once I actually started using it, I was like, oh man, this rope is like, really legit so it goes on your waist like this so instead of so the cool thing about this rope is if you know you your, your rope's all in the mucky water and stuff like let's say you're packing a rope at the end of the day instead of going over your shoulder or awkwardly trying to stuff the bag you can hang it on your waist and you can pack it like this and you're probably thinking that's not that big of a deal it's not cool but trust me when when your rope is all tangled up and it's all strewn out all over the place and you're feeding it like this you realize that this that's really cool so this is cool. So this is a crane. I use this for crane work. I'll rappel into the tree, take it off, you know, throw it down. And this bag is freaking awesome. Like August did a really, really good job coming up with this. This right here is 32 strand Drenaline from Teufelberger. And this has, this one has a spliced eye in it. I like the spliced eyes. I can splice some stuff. I can splice a rigging line, uh, <laughs> and not very well, but I can do it and I can splice the um, The slings, but I can't really do climb lines yet um, But anyways, so I, I like splice size. That was just a long way of saying I like splice size And so this is a 32 strand um, and it's also a double braid has a core on the inside and the, the nice thing that I like about this rope is I found because like uh, You know, this is a 24 strand. This is a 32. You, you see it's it's a lot smoother of a jacket and what I've found is that this does really well in the mechanical devices you know m most climbers now it seems like have moved towards mechanical and away from the rope on rope systems like press six and Blake's hitches and stuff and 
having the smaller, smoother strands, it really seems to just make everything flow more smoothly in the, in the climbing system. So I've really moved towards more strands, the better for the, the most part. So this is a really nice rope. It's really a, I can't remember what, what it costs. It's been a long time since I bought it, but I remember it was actually one of the, the cheaper ropes. It was actually a really good deal, but this is Dreneline by Teufel Burger. And it's a really good rope. I, I really like it. It performs really well in the various devices. You'll, you'll kind of pull your hair out like when you're switching to like between press it cords and devices and ropes, it's crazy what a difference it makes, what kind of rope you have in each device. Um, but like I said, that stuff gets really confusing and I haven't used Prusik cordage in, in years. I've just done mechanical because it's just, for me, it's just so much better. It's, it's just for all sorts of reasons. But moving on, these are my, uh, and, and I have, a lot of the stuff, I have the same things on this shelf, but this shelf is just the stuff I use really regularly. So these are my sort of go-to spurs. These are uh, Buck Light Titanium Spurs from Buckingham. I think this is a big buck pad. And I'm all about these spurs. They are awesome. They're really durable. Um, they're really lightweight for how strong they are. Like I can chuck this out of the tree and I'm not worried about it breaking. It's like super sturdy, but it's also really lightweight. So you get a lot of padding and it's really lightweight. The biggest thing I could suggest when it comes to spurs are these Velcro straps, dude. I'm telling you, I'd rather have like cheap, bulky, heavy spurs with Velcro straps than have really nice high-end spurs with leather straps. Because the Velcro, you just get it so, it's just like the perfect snug fit. When, I mean, when I switched to these, I was just like blown away that not everybody uses these. These are just magnetic gaff guards you know, because I'll put these in my bag when I travel. And anyways, um, Velcro lowers and, and upper, but really the lower straps, especially if you don't have a big heel on your boot for spurs, the Velcro is freaking sweet, I promise you. Like, I can't remember what they cost, but it's, it's worth it. Just, you really gotta trust me on the Velcro. I'm all about it. There's another one I've seen where it's like Velcro, but it's got an extra buckle thing on it. I've tried those and I think that's just like a, sort of a gimmick. Just the basic Velcro lower straps. They're awesome, these spurs are awesome. Buckingham actually sent me those spurs, I didn't pay for those. Um, they're really expensive, so I probably wouldn't recommend them for a climber unless you're sure that you're gonna be climbing as a career. You know, if you're just like testing the waters, you probably wanna buy cheaper spurs. The thing about spurs is they really all do the same thing. There are different levels of comfort and weight to them, but they really all do the same thing for the most part. Some are longer than others, pole gaffs versus tree gaffs, that might be something to consider. If you are in an area with thick bark, you want tree gaffs. With thin bark, you want pole gaffs. But for the most part, the spurs are all gonna do the same thing. Okay, so some more stuff on my shelf. This is an Omni Block. So this, I, I use this thing for when I'm climbing in the tree. So this little carabiner is what I keep on my harness. This is an Amsteel Ultra Sling. And I use this just for like positioning, for redirects, or if I want something to tie into and I don't want a bunch of friction. I just carry this on my harness and I uh, use it, basically I, ha I hang on this thing. I just use it for life support. Generally speaking, you wanna keep your rigging gear separate from your climbing gear. And if you read the you know ANSI guidelines and stuff, they're real strict about it. You know, to be honest, to be frank, like I use this mostly for climbing, but I'll lower one limb or something on it. My, my theory is, you know, I'm, I'm like 180 pounds. If I lower a you know, 40 pound branch or something on this, I just, you know, I just don't think it's a big deal. I, I understand why they make the guidelines like that, you know, because they don't want people making mistakes, getting their rigging and their climbing gear messed up. Cause you might put a whole bunch of stress on the rigging gear and not know that it's compromise so i get why they make that rule but i use this for my body weight and it's basically if the branch is smaller than me then i'll rig it off this too which i don't recommend but that's that is what i do this is a i'm gonna put it back in the tripod okay this is a lanyard this is a rope lanyard and um this is an art positioner too and you know i like it a lot I do use steel carabiners on my lanyards because, like I said, it's easier to manipulate and to throw around the tree. So, in the Pacific Northwest, most guys use 
steel cores and other places most people use rope and lanyards and there's a good reason for both and I actually use both. I, I go back and forth a lot on these and so the rope lanyard is really nice for deciduous trees. It's really nice for positioning, it's more malleable, it's softer, you can, you just have, it just feels like it's lighter, it doesn't tangle so much, it's just easier to maneuver around in those trees and so I use this all the time if I'm climbing a deciduous tree, basically of any sort, it seems like I, I use this. Unless unless it's like a big, like a big fat cottonwood or something where there's very little taper. Then, you know, the, the nice thing about the steel core flip line is it's so much easier to flip around big wood. Like 10 times easier to flip, it seems like. Maybe not 10 times, but like twice as easy to flip around big wood. Um, the steel core also... People will tell you that you can't cut it with a chainsaw, but I've cut I've cut mine with a chainsaw <laughs> before, and uh, you know that steel on the inside is just an extra layer of safety. That's one of the things these safety guys. Some of these guys will just harp on and on. Is, is harp the right word? But they'll go on and on about how important safety is, and they're climbing on rope lanyards. Like you know, this is just objectively so much safer than this because there's a piece of steel in it. Not to say that you shouldn't double tie in and stuff like, but you really want to double tie in on this because if you just nick this with a chainsaw when you're up there, like you're out of the tree. So you, you want to be tied in. This one you should be tied in, but if you nick this with a saw, you know, I, uh, I did a video on my old channel. Um, one of the earlier videos I did, called the ultimate flip line cut test or something, where I actually did that. I like really tried to cut through it with a chainsaw. Dude, it's hard to cut through these. Uh, this is a car this carabiner I have on here. This is a, uh, it's got like that wiry gate. I actually just put this on today. Um, and that's just to keep it sort of more tidy. So that this, sometimes this carabiner flops around and it ends up like sideways and stuff. So I just put that on there to keep it a little neater and a little safer. So I'm not like sideways on the carabiner, you know? Um, this is a climb air. This is a double-ended flip line, so this adjusts both ways. Uh, when people are starting, I, I recommend starting with the climber because when you get used to this flip line, especially you know when you're going up a tree and you're trying to get past branches and stuff, having that double end is like super awesome. And once you're used to that cam, it's really easy to adjust. But the problem is, is when you get used to a uh, you see, most of the, the flip line cams, and flip line and lanyard, I'm using those interchangeably, but. Most flip line cams, you adjust like this, right? And guys get used to that, and then they try to use the climb air, and they like, they just can't get, you know, their, their brain is so used to being able to adjust the lanyard like this that they just really struggle with it. I learned on that flip line, and then I use these, and uh, so I, I use both really comfortably. Flip lining is a weird thing because I always keep my cam, my cam on my right side because it's how I learned, and it's just what I'm used to. So I, I dangle my flip line from my right side, right, and the thing is, is a lot of guys they dangle it from their left side so that's not interfering with their chainsaw, and I actually think that that makes more sense. I think that's a better way to do it, but. You know, this lizard brain of mine is so used to having my chainsaw and my flip line on this side that, dude, I really struggle. Like, I, I've tried like a whole bunch of times to just force myself to get used to having my lanyard on my left side and throwing it with my left hand. I'm right-handed and I really can't do like, uh, I'm just like really right-handed and I cannot get used to the flip line on my left side. I wish I would have just started that way. That way I wouldn't know any better. Because my flip line does tangle up with my chainsaw all the time, and it really annoys me. But like I said, this, this lizard brain of mine, I just can't, I can't make it work on my left side. So I just deal with the, I just deal with the, <laughs> with it tangling up. These are my hand saws. These are both silky hand saws. The, it's just, it's the best. It's the best brand. They, they're from Japan. They're awesome. This is a Sugoi 360, and this has large teeth on it. The nice thing about the curved blade is uh, for whatever reason, when you drag it across a limb, you're actually engaging more surface area because of the curvature of the blade. So you actually cut through the piece more quickly with a curved blade. This little, uh, this, this little hook right here is really awesome for like, say I'm in a, a fir or a cedar or something, I can like reach out and grab little dead twigs and kind of break them off. And so th this hook is really nice. 
Um, but I use a, and so, so this is kind of, I'll use this for like doing big trees, but I'm, I'm really, uh, yeah, anyways, this, I use this for fine pruning. This is a, a Sarugi 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter. I don't, I don't know the size word. It's a 300. Actually, oh, it probably says it. Yeah, okay. Silky Tsurugi 300 millimeter. This has finer teeth on it, and it's also a straight blade. So the straight blade is nice because you can get it into much tighter spots than the curved blade, but it cuts more slowly because it doesn't have that curvature. These hand saws are super cool because to replace the blade is really easy. This thing just comes right off. They also sell a curved version of this, but yeah, changing the blade is like super duper easy. Silkies are just so awesome. They're just such high quality. They're, they're really amazing. You really know, I've used a few different brands and everybody knows that Silky is just like the best. So I use this for fine pruning. I use the curved one for large tree pruning. And then zip, zip tied onto this deal, I've got these, uh, I think these are Felco 2s. Felcos are like really awesome for hand pruning. I don't do that much pruning these days, but um, back when I was doing a lot more pruning, uh, th these these Felcos, Felcos are like the same thing as Silky. Everybody knows they're just, they're just awesome. They're the best. So that's what I use for my sort of fine pruning. And I've just got, I, I just keep it zip tied. It's just zip, right, the, the hand shears are just zip tied to the, um, the handsaw, that way I can just like clip it to my pants or whatever if I'm climbing like a apple tree that I've got both on me, you know? This is just a bag of, <laughs> this is just GoPro stuff. Um, like when I'm mounting a camera to the tree, I found that I can basically, uh, just with these three little things, I'll like cut a slit in the tree, pound the wedge in, clip this on, the GoPro attaches to this, Traver Hearn, I think he showed me this uh, trick. And then uh, also I can clamp that around a branch too. So this is kind of like all, the only thing I use to mount my GoPro into clever places. And I can actually do a lot with just those three things in this little bag. It's just a bag of wedges. Okay, so this is my Petzl, so this is cool, this little bag right here. Um, this is my ascending equipment. Right, so this is my foot ascender. It's just the Petzl one. Um, I, I really like having, some of them don't have this the, the locking catchy thing. Uh, this one does. Um, I think I bought these on Amazon, I think it was like $5 more for the one that locks, but this is my knee ascent system. And the really cool thing about this is, um, this is sort of your knee and chest tether whole ascent system all in one. So this is gonna to clip to the back of your harness like this. This is gonna go down to your left foot. Right, and then, um, and then it has this little tether on it, right? So instead of wearing like a chest harness or something around my neck, it's just built into the device. So this will clip into your device. So when you step up, it pulls the device up with you. And so I like this a lot because it's one fewer thing that I have to think about. I don't have to uh, worry about having a chest harness or anything. I just use the, the Petzl. It's all Petzl, so it all integrates really well with each other. It works really well with the Sequoia. The, um, the Monkey Beaver actually suspenders have a little accessory carabiner on the chest, so um, this isn't so, you know, it, it already kind of has one of these integrated with it, which is great. But like on my Petzl Sequoia, this is really cool. And I, I like to prune with the Sequoia too, because mobile, it's all about mobility when you're pruning, right? And then when you're doing removals, if you're using a big saw, it's all about padding, you know? So if you're doing a lot of pruning, I recommend Sequoia, a lot of removals, I recommend the Monkey Beaver, but that's my, uh, you know, and then it all fits really well into this little bag. So it's all just, like all of my ascending, you know, all of my ascent stuff, it just fits real neatly into this bag. And I, I just think that it, it works really great. This is just a pencil, uh, uh, this is just a throw cube, throw line thing. So, you know, it unfolds and uh, right here I've got I, I like the, uh, I don't know, I think it's called Zing It, I think the line is. I think it's 
versus one point something. I like the kind of thicker stuff um, just because it seems to get less tangled up. Um, but anyways, but anyways, um, this is a 16 ounce, this one on here. And so basically when you're dealing with throw lines, <laughs> I'm like really bad at throw ball, but I do understand that the, the thing about throw lines is the heavier the weight, the further, the higher you can throw it. No, I'm sorry. No, the lighter the weight, the further and the higher you can throw it. But the, the heavier the weight, you might not be able to throw it so high, but you might be able to get it back down to yourself more easily. So like, you know, imagine like a really smooth bark tree. It's like easy for this to slide down, but if it's like a really thick bark tree or you got a lot of twigs in the way, you know, it might be kind of hard to work this thing down. So, you know, 16, so like a, a really heavy weight is really good for really dense, bushy trees, trying to get the line down to yourself. The lighter weight's really good for, you know, trying to get way up there, maybe with the big shot or something. What I typically do is I just use the heavy weight because I'm so bad at throw ball. <laughs> I just aim low anyways because I try to get it really high and I just suck at it. And if I want to get it really high, I'll generally I'll just use the um, the big shot and then I can use the heavy weight and just shoot it pretty high up there. But it seems like all the really good guys that I've seen throwing throw ball, they all throw 12s, it seems like which is sort of a good middle ground. Um, they range from basically 10 ounce to 16 ounce. And it doesn't sound like a big difference, but it's actually a huge difference when you're throwing these things. So the guys that are good at it seem to use 12. I like 16, but I'm really, <laughs> I'm really bad at it though. Um, yeah, and I think I've got a couple more of these uh, cubes too, but I, you know, there's not really anything different to show in those. This is just gas and bar oil. This is a, uh, it's just bar oil. I, I don't know. I, I don't think it matters what kind of bar oil you use. I've used a bunch and I don't notice any difference. Uh, this is my gas can, um, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Uh, whenever I fill this thing up, I always, I, I always use these. Uh, that's a five gallon, so actually uh, I use two of these, but this is a the still synthetic. I use the synthetic because Gordy said it's better than the than the orange bottle stuff. So I use the silver bottle stuff, and um, I'll put them. I'll put these together to make five gallons. And I always do like five gallons at a time. That way, I just know that it's like this is the dedicated saw gas. I'm not trying to like mix the ratios myself. I'm not trying to do like a gallon here, a gallon there. I do five gallons at a time, and it's like I only put mix in that can, and that way I just know because. Uh, I've had years ago somebody filled up one of the, the gas cans and like we blew up all of our saws because it was just straight gas and so I just I don't mess around with it. I use ethanol free gas. Um, I don't. So the thing about ethanol free gas is the ethanol breaks down the plastics and stuff. Um, and it seems like the, the way I understand it, it's not that big of a deal if you're cycling through the gas. What happens is if you let the saw sit or something, that ethanol breaks down the parts. So. If you're using the saws a bunch, it might not make that big of a difference, but if your saw's sitting for a while, you wanna use ethanol-free gas because, I don't know, that's just what the saw builders tell me. Every, all, all of them <laughs> all of them say use ethanol-free gas. So I use ethanol-free gas, I just do what they say. Like uh, Gordy and uh, Ryan from MPI Built and uh, Wes, uh, John's Custom Saws, they've all said the same thing. They just say use ethanol-free gas. So I use that. I don't know if the octane matters. I have no idea. Um, I've used all, all three of them and I don't notice any difference. These are just cork boots. Uh, I keep them on the shelf because I can't keep these in the house because they're, you know, they're just pokey boots for mucking around the woods. And they're, they're really awesome. They're, you really get a lot of good footing. These are uh, Hoffman 16 inch uh, corks. Oh, oh man, there's, there's a lot of junk in this thing. Okay, so in this bag, this is all Ascent stuff. And the reason that I keep all this is for, is like, is like primarily for training people, you know? So I've got all this, this is like mostly just random, uh, like ascending and rope attaching stuff. This is like really old school, um, the Haas system. <laughs> this thing is really old. Um, and it's just a bunch of random stuff. This is like a, a split tail that I, you know, it's just like just random stuff, but I said I'd go through everything. So I'm going to go through it. This is a, a non-adjustable friction saver. 
Um, I used to use friction savers a lot, and then I just got so many stuck, I just gave up on them. I just don't care. I just deal with the friction. But, uh, you know, the idea is you put this around a branch, then you run your rope through this thing. And then, um, you know, you tie a little knot, and the knot will pass through the big ring. It'll grab the little ring, and it'll pull the whole system out. I got these stuck so many times, I just gave up. It looks like I saw in Westbrook, they've got one called chicken rings, where it's two large rings, and then one floating small ring in the center, so that it doesn't matter which end you tie the knot on. You can still pull it out, because a lot of times what happens is guys will tie the knot on the, the wrong end, and then it gets stuck. Well, those chicken rings look kind of cool, but I haven't used them. I really gave up on friction savers a long time ago, especially with you know, the advent of SRT. I've got a bunch of these Sokka systems. I've had like, you know, every one that they've come out with. The Sokkas are really cool because they're um, real stiff, you know. There is a big dispute between the Sokka and the Haas years ago. Um, I think I got a Haas in here somewhere, right? Maybe I don't. Maybe I gave that away, actually. Actually, you know what? I don't think I have a Haas. Yeah, okay. No, I gave that to somebody. Um, I was like letting people borrow stuff. and then I, Here's an adjustable friction saver. Same thing as one I just showed you, except it's got a pressic on it with a small ring, which is better than the non-adjustable one. So yeah, just some extra sockas that I've got. Um, double hand ascender, which I've never really used. Uh, I don't know. It's just like an ascender. I, I don't. Some of this stuff is probably junk, honestly, but I think I'm going to need it. This is like a canopy anchor thing. Um, and uh, it's got a bunch of loops in it. It's like adjustable or something. I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I don't really know how to use this thing. I bought it years ago and then never really used it. It's a canopy anchor for putting at the base of the tree for your climbing system. And I don't really know what it, how it works that well. This is a chest harness, which I actually really like. It's called the Chester, I think. Um, I think the brand is for SRT. And I like this thing a lot uh, until I got that pet. This is what I use until I got that Petzl system. So I don't need a chest thing anymore. This is a loop for a Prusik. It's a long. This is just, uh, I don't know what that is. Extra throw lines. Oh, so I put these throw weights on this hand ascender. And like um, when I'm ascending a rope, a lot of times if I've got a long way to go, I'll just put this to the bottom of the rope. So I've got uh, just weight to keep the rope stiff. So when I'm lifting my leg, I'm not lifting the rope. Uh, extra sling, this ghetto neck tether, extra bungee, some extra foot ascenders. It's all kind of junk until I'm trying to like teach a couple people how to climb a tree and then it seems like I end up using all that stuff trying to, you know, throw some systems together. I'm not going to go through all this stuff, but I keep all my chainsaw stuff in this ammo can, like files and bar wrenches and stuff. I keep it in the ammo can because the ammo can's really really durable and it's also waterproof so i want to make sure i keep water off my uh ascenders so this is all climbing gear i've basically been through all this stuff already but um so these are the gecko carbon fibers and i really don't have anything bad to say about these they're awesome it's just that they're a little delicate you got to be a little more careful with them the titanium ones are tougher because they're made of metal these are really really light but uh you got to be a little more ginger with them and but they're, they're really very good i like them a lot there's my sequoia get that out of the way these are my Buckingham Steels. These are like 12 years old. Um, somebody's pilfered the bottom straps off them, but they get the job done. This is what, I think is what August and Buck and Billy Ware and uh, Jed use these. And they're great, they're comfortable. They're just, they're just heavy and they're a little clunky, you know, but they really get the job done and they're fine. Buckingham Steels, they're just tough as nails. There's a, uh, I've got my SMH10 in that. I got my old scene in that. These are the suspenders for the um, Sequoia. This is my Coco flip line. I bought this for Hawaii because you want a really short steel core flip line. So I think it's 10 feet long. This is a first aid kit that I've not opened. I got from Buckingham. In this bag, I have a 300 foot adrenaline line actually. So this is the same thing as it was in my crane bag, which is 120 feet. This one's 300 feet. I'll use that sometimes for really tall trees, long ascents, stuff like that. Just some extra helmets. This is a, well, I'll, sh I'll show you that in a second. This is just a little hatchet. And this is a bag I wash my ropes in. I wash my ropes, um, I just don't like them be all muddy and stuff and they last longer. So I, I put it in that bag and I wash them. Those are just extra hanks of climbing line right there. Um, old stuff, see it's, it's all static because I was big into static for a while. 
Extra slings, I don't use these anymore because I got the August Haneke stuff, but there's no reason to throw these away. So I just keep these slings because they're just useful. It's just a little hatchet for inside the tree. Okay, I found another bag of junk here. <laughs> so this is just an extra chainsaw lanyard. This one isn't the bungee type. I don't know if it really makes any difference. This is a uh, tether for a rope wrench. These things go on the back of the saw to when you're in the tree. I don't, they don't, they're not that great. This is an old Omni block that I've retired because it doesn't, I mean, you can't tell. It, does, it just feels wrong when you swivel it. It's not that smooth. So that's retired. I just kind of, but I'll use it for like, you know, hauling uh, like small, like the pulley still works, but I don't quite trust it. Uh, but, you know, you never know when it's good for like, you know, hauling something up a tree or something. Maybe I'll use it. Just an extra pulley. Um, this is just an extra uh, cam that I, I, you know, I'll use that to like, actually use this if I make like zip lines for my kids in my yard or something. It's just something to hold the rope in place when I keep it tight, but I don't climb with it. Just random pulleys, a uh, random ring. These stuff come in handy sometimes. I got this for my rope runner and it just made my rope runner not work as well. Um, I don't know why I've kept it. Just accessory carabiners. I used to climb with a figure eight on my harness all the time until I learned how to tie a munter sitch, and then I just really didn't have any need for it. Plus, with SRT, there's just not really any reason to use the figure eight, but I still have it. This is pretty old, too. This is just, like, for rigging purposes. It's just a rope grab for big stuff. I don't really use that either. Uh, th this is kind of cool. This is... I actually use this when I make a Z-rig, like a mechanical advantage type deal i'll use this system i should put me i should even make a video on this and demonstrate it because it's actually pretty slick um but basically this is cool it's a double pulley but there's a little cam on one side and uh, this cam grabs the rope and so you basically string the rope between these two points and then the, the, it goes through the cam last and when you pull the rope tight, these get close together and you end up with like a five to one mechanical advantage, but it also holds the rope in place. So you don't need to tend your slack. This is a SMC, some sort of double pulley. This is the double Omni block. These are, this all works with half inch line. I should make a little demonstration video of this because this is actually, um, I bought these two, I sort of came up with the system myself, just buying these two together and I just keep them in this bag together. And it's actually, you can get like a ton of pull just with a half inch line and just these two things. And you don't need a, a but like one guy can have the strength of four or five men, plus the rope holds itself in place. So put that in there. Just put it in. Okay, so everything on my top shelf. So I'm not sure if Buckingham sells this bag or not yet. I think it was a prototype when they sent it to me, but it's like the big buck bag or something it's empty right now but this is what i use for travel like on you know the, the airplane and stuff this bag is like really awesome it's got a really cool compartment for a helmet it's just a it's just a great bag and so that's from buckingham let's see this is just like this is just like books and stuff like this is like a tree risk assessment forms this is like just nerdy arborist tree id books and stuff I don't really do much of that stuff these days, but that's what's in there. This is a Grand, for, Grand Forest Brooks American Fallers Axe. Things a three and a half pound head on a 35 inch handle. This is also a Grand Forest Brook. This is a large splitting axe. So I think it's like a four pound head and a shorter handle. And then it's got the guard here as well. I pretty much just keep like long stuff up here. These are ARS uh, long reach pruning shears. I just call them nibblers. And these are really, <laughs> these are like the best for fine pruning. Those, those nibblers are awesome. This is a, a big shot that I've, this is a big shot that I put a bunch of work into. This is like a, a, a trigger system that I came up with so that I can get it really tight and then set it and then it's like a quick release trigger. It's kind of complicated. I'm not going to go into all of it, but basically I set up with a presser cord, a micro pulley and uh, Whisper literally sells, I forget what it's called, but it's like a quick release thing for the big shot. So I sort of rigged all this up for my big shot and it, it actually works like super well. 
This is a silky Zubat pole saw. It's really awesome for, like for, for fine printing, you know? You can really cut some delicate stuff and it, it telescopes. It's a really nice pole saw. It's not super long. They do have longer ones, but I don't know. The, my, my philosophy with the pole printer and pole saw stuff is like, if it's really that, it's, it's like some of them are really long and it's like, if it's really that long, you know, let me, I'll show you, hold on. So like, th this thing's actually really cool. This is a Fiskars, and this is telescoping, and it's a, a pole printer. And unfortunately, I don't, I bought this at Costco years ago, and I've tried to use it actually kind of as little as possible because they don't make them anymore, I don't think. And the ones that they now make are, they're like more complicated and they, they just don't work as well. But this is like a really basic, really simple design. I actually really love these pole printers. It's just a simple design. These loosen up and this actually goes pretty long. Um, and when it comes to pole printers, I like the really small head. I like to make tiny cuts because my sort of philosophy on the whole pull printer thing, some of them are like really big gates, but it takes a long time to pull that far down to cut those. And I like to be able to just make little cuts. And if it's like a really big cut, then I just, I just don't do it. I will either use a pull saw, if that's not enough, then I'll use, I'll climb the tree. Or I like chainsaws on sticks, but I don't like using the really big pull saws that much. And you know what I found? If, if I can't reach it or I can't cut it and I tell the customer, Hey, I can't cut that with my pole printer, it's too big. They never say it, wish you had a bigger pole printer. So, I just leave it at that. So, some of these pole printers are like massive heads on them. Like, you're really trying to cut through that. So, I just don't deal with it. I just, I like the small pole printer head. And, you know, and I don't like to put a whole bunch of extensions on a pole saw and try to get way up there. I just, I just don't deal with it. But that's, uh, I think that's all I had on the high shelf. But yeah, this is... This is kind of a special pole printer because they don't make it anymore, but it's Fiskars, and uh, yeah, I think we're about done, I think, oh yeah, <laughs> no we're not. These are my mechanical friction devices. Okay, so this is the Spider Jack 3. This is the first device that I ever bought, you know, switching from a Presic cord to this thing was really a huge game changer. So this is only meant to be used double rope, so the line comes in, it goes around, and it's pretty big, it's pretty bulky, but what's kind of special about this is, so this opens it up so that the rope can slide through, right, by pulling this down. But it's also got this little wooden thing which actually engages the rope. It's actually, I think it's called a clutch. And so with this one, it actually has two things that you're doing at once. You're pushing this down and you're also controlling it with this. So you have a ton of control with this thing on double line. Um, so I'm actually a big fan of this. So I actually recommend this device if you're a diehard DDRT or DRT or whatever it is, you know, MRS, you know, moving rope system. If you're big on double rope, this device is, is really nice. It's a ton of control. It's just amazing. It just gobbles up the rope when you're, you know, tending your slack. It just feeds right in. And this device is, I think, the best a double rope device. I think it's really great. Downside is that you can't do single line with it, which is actually a big downside. So I mostly do single line. And so I just, I find myself just, I just haven't used this in a long time. Um, sort of sadly, because I'm actually really fond of this. This is the first mechanical device I ever had, the Spider Jack 3. It's still a great device, but it's just not for me. This is the second device I ever got. This is a Unisender by Rock Exotica. This device is really cool because it's midline attachable. It just zigzags sort of like, you know, right onto the rope real easy. This is an aftermarket part I got from Rion Rounds um, to keep the rope in place. And it also has these uh, bollards. This is like a big design flaw. Well, I'm sure they had a good reason for not incorporating this probably uh, when they designed it. But the problem with this device is the rope is always flopping out. And th this thing is really cool. It's really compact. You can do single line, you can do double line. Um, you know, it can go single line just on the rope or you can bring it back down to this thing right here and then you can do double line with it and it's really cool. A lot of guys really like it. The downside is it's kind of funky to descend to like on a single line. You have to like wrap it around. It doesn't wear the best um, and it's just, it's, 
you know, it was really ahead of its time and it's really a great device, but it's just, it's hard to, for me to use this thing smoothly. I just find it to be clunky. It's great how quick it can go off and on the rope, but for me, it's just not as smooth as I like. And to be honest, I like all these devices. I like different things about all these devices, but I don't use that so much. This is a, a rope runner um, that when you have the carabiner attached to your uh, bridge, this is on there, you know, by Singing Tree. This is the first rope runner. They've, they've made two now, and this is the first one. And uh, this is the device that I used for a, a long time. Um, this is my second one, actually. I wore the first one down a lot, and it just goes on the rope. You can use it for single line and double line as long as you, uh, you know, have like a ring on your bridge and you bring it back down. Um, I'm sure this video could be done better if I was actually like in a harness and with ropes and stuff, but I think it's long enough already. So I'm just sort of blasting through this, but this is a great device for single line. One of the downside is it's kind of hard on the thumbs. A lot of guys don't like it. There is a, a attachment you can get to make that smoother, but you know, that, that's one of the, the problems. One of the cool things about it is you know, this part wears out and you can actually rotate it and you can replace it. And you can actually replace most of the parts on this thing and replace it really cheap. This, this might be my favorite device. It's really simple. You can replace all the parts. This tab is kind of flimsy. This tends to break all the time. This is for keeping it next to your chest when you're going up on a you know chest tether when you're going up um, on your ascenders and stuff. But it's the Singing Tree Rope Runner. I think it's a really awesome device. They they made some improvements with the Rope Runner Pro. Like you know this is more robust. Your chest attachment thingy. Um, this can all. One of the downsides of this one is when you when you sort of take it apart. It all just kind of falls apart. You end up holding like four things in your hands. And this, you know, everything is supposed to sort of stay together when you take it apart. Um, see, it all sort of stays together. Um, but I've actually dropped this part out of the tree, trying to open it in the tree. So it doesn't stay together quite as well as it's marketed to. I recently stopped using it because the spring just doesn't engage as well as it used to. You'll see in my Hawaii video, I kind of talk about it um, doing that mango because... It's just not grabbing like it used to. There was like a notice on these. They had some bad batches, I think. Something went wrong with them. And uh, so the improvements are this is a lot smoother, easier on the thumbs than this. It's just sort of more streamlined and smooth, but it actually is just sort of a more fancy version of this. It really doesn't do anything different. And honestly, I might even switch back to this one because I don't really feel that safe using this anymore. It's just not engaging like it should. This is what I've been climbing on now. This is the Akimbo. This thing is really cool. I actually got this years ago, and then I got it when it first came out and then stopped using it almost immediately. The problem with this is it really doesn't do well with sap. This chest thing is really cool. This is your chest tether, right? So when you're going up the rope, the carabiner is grabbing this, and then you sit down in your saddle. If that comes undone. And the, sort of the thing that makes this really cool is also the thing I sort of hate is you can adjust both of these bollards like that. And you can, you know, move this around and which is cool, right? Except that it sort of just ends up with me constantly adjusting these neurotically and just never uh, being happy or content with it. So it's kind of cool. You can adjust it a lot, but it's also not, I kind of wish you couldn't adjust it so much because then I wouldn't be driving myself so crazy running it. It really hates sap. It, it just doesn't do that well with sap. It seems like deciduous trees. This thing is really slick. It's so easy to put off and on the rope. It looks the coolest for sure of all the devices and it's super compact. I mean, look how tiny it is. So it's got a lot of pros, if it, but it's it's really finicky. You got to have the right rope with it. Um, that adrenaline stuff I was talking about seems to work pretty well, um, but this is really finicky depending what rope you have and adjusting it and sap. So this is kind of like a really great device, but it's, it, it's going to take some tinkering for sure. To be honest, the zigzag is probably the best device. You know, it's so simple. It's definitely the best device for sap. It really doesn't mind the sap that much. The rope just runs through it. It's so easy to use. You pull down on that to lower yourself to the ground. This is one of the older models. The newer ones are kind of like bigger and bulkier. And uh, I kind of like how compact this is. The problem with the zigzag is it's only meant for double line. So you attach this to it, right? Um, and what this does, this is a chicane. This puts a bend in the rope above the zigzag, 
so it relieves pressure and allows you to work single line. But then the problem is like, look how long and bulky this is. You know, it's just like really cumbersome. It's kind of lame. I don't really like having to carry a separate thing in the tree. Um, I like my device to be able to do single line and double line. But this zigzag works really well, honestly. It's just usually what I recommend people get. It's probably the most popular device. This swivels on your harness, so it's easy to use. And uh, this actually works pretty well, the chicane. I just, I, it just bothers me having to carry two devices. I, I'm real sort of like a minimalist type when I'm climbing. I, I try to carry as few things as possible, but a lot of gearheads, they like carrying a bunch of stuff on their harnesses. They're tougher than I am because I get tired carrying a bunch of stuff. So I try to carry as little as possible. So I really don't like having to do, have two things, but th this zigzag really is very good. I'm gonna keep trying the, the Kimbo for a while. Like I said, you know, I like all these devices. I think that they all do what they, you know, they've all got different strengths and weaknesses, but they're all, they're all better than Prestic Core. I, I think that, I think most people can agree with that. Uh, you know, they, they've gotten really expensive. They, they were cheaper a few years ago. I haven't bought any in a couple of years. The, the most recent one I bought was the Rope Runner Pro, and that was probably a couple of years ago. I think they were all around $300. I think they're like $400 for about every one of these now and the zigzag's even worse because you got to buy the chicane separately and last i checked i think this was like 350 dollars and the chicane is like 180 dollars so whatever that adds up to is a lot more than these other devices so those are all the climbing devices that i have like i said i like all of them but none of them are perfect oh man i cannot believe that you just watched that whole video you are such a nerd <laughs> <laughs> now you know everything that I know about tree gear. I, I can't think of really anything else. I just went through all the stuff that I have. That's literally all the tree gear that I even own. I'm actually trying to like think up if I have anything else anywhere else, but that that's everything I own. That's basically everything that I know about tree gear all into one video. So if you made it this far, thanks. I appreciate you watching. You know, I'd appreciate it if, you know, maybe you could share this video with somebody who's trying to figure out what kind of gear to buy first, you know. Um, it gets real confusing trying to decide what gear you want to buy, especially it depends, you know, if how much money you want to spend. Like, is this going to be your career or are you just testing the waters? You know, you might want to get cheaper stuff to the beginning. Most of the stuff I showed you is like pretty top of the line, pretty expensive stuff. I've sort of like gotten rid of a lot of my cheaper stuff, sold it or it just disappears over the years. Like I said, I've been collecting this stuff for like 12 years. So it's a lot of money. Um, the stuff adds up quick. So, but it's good to be informed about what you're getting. So if you think that somebody could benefit from understanding this gear, please share this video with them. I'd appreciate it. I'm hoping that this is a, a helpful video for people because it's just sort of a, there's a big learning curve for this equipment, there's a lot to talk about and um, hopefully this will save me some time. I'll probably just not have to, I, like I said, I get questions all the time. So now I'm just gonna show people this long video and just say, just watch this. that will tell you everything that I know about tree cutting equipment. So that's about it. Please like and subscribe. Make sure that you're subscribed to this channel. It's, you know, it's, it's a newer channel than my original one. And uh, yeah, I just appreciate you taking the time to watch it. You can buy my merch at guiltyoftreason.com. You can buy this shirt if you want. And uh, I think that's a, Hi, I think that's about it. So, all right, thanks, I'll see ya.